Hi, this is Dwight. Today we're going to start talking about the economy of the United States of America. Uh, it's probably a good place to start our journey this semester in that the American economy still is about one-fifth of global GDP. It's been the world's foremost economic power pretty much since the end of World War II and has gone from strength to strength in a lot of areas. It has a few weaknesses, but we'll get to those. It has vast economic, cultural, political, social, and military power, and that reaches into pretty much every corner of the globe. Uh, what you watch on your TV at night is probably influenced by something that happened in America. At the level of corporate organization, uh, the methods and philosophy developed by U.S. firms are also closely copied and widely discussed. Uh, the very idea of studying management as a discipline pretty much originated there. And we've been doing it ever since. Uh, the world's first business school, for example, which was the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, was established in 1881. Uh, the, the MBA degree, which you're now studying, was a pretty much an American invention at the Univers University of Chicago. More concretely, for decades, the U.S. has effectively underwritten global capitalism, uh, not only setting the rules of the road, but helping to enforce them along the way. Uh, through the, from the Bretton Woods currency exchange system until its collapse in 1971, and informally through the vast resources of the Federal Reserve. The, overall, the U.S. model is famous for free markets, few curbs on managerial prerogative, and generally limited government intervention, although that's changing again. Uh, happens when you get new administrations in. But despite its influence and success, the country is facing some challenges. But the emergence of the American powerhouse pretty much began at the founding. Uh, 1775, 17, 1783, the U.S. Uh, War of Independence. Uh, we fought that with Britain. The political leaders have been keen to distance themselves from that point on, from Europe and from European traditions. In fact, if you take a careful reading of the U.S. Constitution, you'll discover that a lot of it was meant to curb the power of government itself. Because having overthrown the tyranny, as, as the Americans saw it, of King George III, they were not going to allow their own government to, form, uh, to be tyrannical as well. Uh, the U.S. largely owes its strength at that time to expansion westward. The constant expansion meant, of course, constant innovation, constant competition, and ever-increasing resources. Between 1850 and the First World War, Around 55 million people left Europe for the U.S. Some of them to start a new life, some of them because the societies in which they were living didn't allow for the entrepreneurship, for the innovative ideas that they had to flourish. America's population grew from 5.3 million in 1800 to 76 million by 1900. By 1890, 80% of New York citizens were immigrants. Uh, or the children of immigrants, 87% of Chicago's and 84% of Detroit and Milwaukee's, the industrial heartland. A uh, central part of the rise was its internal growth, that expansion westward, as I mentioned. And industry and commerce continued to grow in stature and sophistication, innovations of various sorts. Uh, new innovations sprung up, which occasionally allowed their investors to develop new companies. Uh, John Deere with, you know, with the steel plow. Uh, Cyrus McCormick, to sell his reaper, invented, you know, invented consumer finance. Innovations like that helped to power the economy for decades. But as the Industrial Revolution gathered pace, you know, with its origins in the UK, the sophistication and complexity of, of, of firms increased because they had access to, or they had, they had access to a truly unique idea. You know, they had basically a monopoly on an intellectual property idea, and that gave them tremendous power. The growth of U.S. early multinational heavily based around the export of new technologies. We were shipping it around the world. But also threw up new ideas of, of business management and how we should organize those. Uh, what your author refers to as Fordism. Uh, strangely, that comes out of Orwell. Uh, but, you know, he's British, so I, I, I'll excuse that. Uh, Represented regular, regularity and standardization. I mean, standardization of, of parts actually began with the assembly of, of firearms. Uh, that we're using interchangeable parts rather than milling, you know, to fit. And that transformed into, you know, the Singer Corporation, 
and eventually Henry Ford perfected it in the Willow Run plant where everything was standardized, where rubber, steel, coal went in one end and finished automobiles came out the other. But also the Human Relations School was an outgrowth of that, uh, probably as a direct reaction to Taylorism. Uh, the Scientific Management School, even today, is, is seen in, you know, in rather an ill light. But if you consider that some of the world's largest multinational corporations, uh, some of our most successful companies, McDonald's still does time and motion studies, for example. Uh, if you look at Walmart, I mean, there is what part of the success is based upon logistics change and getting the price down as, as low as you can by cutting out all of the extraneous stuff. If that's not Taylorism, I don't know what you'd call it. But what was happening we, because of these large trusts, the era of the robber barons, particularly with the railroads, came about, what happens is when companies get sufficiently, str sufficiently strong, they tend to try to close out competition. It's just a kind of a natural urge. And you're going to discover that in your readings, that uh, the goal of every company in the world, I mean, Uber wants to be, be in charge of every vehicle movement in the world at one point in time. Google wants everything from us. Apple you know, it's, it's on your wrist, it's on your phone, it's on your iMac, it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere that you want to be nowadays. Each one of these companies has, you know, the somewhat goal of becoming a monopoly. So that's not unusual. But during the, towards the end of the 19th century, Congress passed some antitrust laws. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was very big on that. He was known as the trust buster uh, when he was elected to, to the presidency. So U.S. capitalism became somewhat more regulated, but the regulation was designed to stimulate competition farther. The idea is that if you have a monopoly in place, it stifles competition. So if you have tr any trust laws, it prevents a monopoly from closing out good ideas, which is, of course, you know, their entire goal in life. In the U.S. context, you need to remember that the state itself is not meant to be a central economic player. Uh, that was part of the design. You know, it goes into all kinds of interesting decisions that you probably haven't thought about. Why is Washington, D.C. the capital of the U.S. and not New York or Philadelphia, which at that time were the two largest uh, industrial cities? Well, they f physically wanted to remove government and business so that they couldn't cooperate and, and collaborate and, and st therefore stifle competition. And you also need to remember, in, for our further discussions, that the United States is the only modern industrial country where they had big business long before they had big government. That it wasn't until uh, FDR's New Deal that we had the first inklings of what big government looked like, and that was in the 30s. Tariff barriers were part of the, the U.S. Uh, growth policy during, the, during that period of time. All countries at one point or another use tariffs to protect nascent industries. You know, the theory is that you engage in what's called uh, import replacement. You protect a local industry, it gets strong enough to stand on its feet, you remove the protection, now it can export. Unfortunately, politicians being politicians, once the barriers are in place, we tend not to remove them. Why? Because every barrier has a vested interest behind it. And if we, one thing we know about vested interest is that they spend a lot of money to stay that way. So the first ter tariffs were installed in 1816, and we, the U.S. widely used those until about World War I. In fact, if we look at the current era of globalization, it's actually the second one. The period from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution up until World War I can be thought of as the first era of globalization, and it was World War I that shut that down. So we had an odd mixture of, of government assistant industry and state and industry at war with each other, which kind of worked. I mean, the so-called robber barons. I mean, Andrew Carnegie uh, was seen as, you know, the ultimate capitalist. Uh, he was the richest man in the world. In fact, if you translated his fortune into current dollars, he was probably the richest man ever. And was widely vilified at the time in the popular press. But uh, if you travel throughout the U.S., you can go to any medium-sized city and you will find a Carnegie library. Because when he came to the U.S. as an ignorant, uneducated immigrant... He spent a lot of time in the New York City Public Library, and that's where he learned. And he wanted to make sure that other immigrants had that same opportunity. So he gave back, and he gave back extensively. 
the late 1920s is one of the biggest ever examples of a speculative financial bump. We need to re think about that context. It ended in one of the world's worst crashes. Uh, I, w I brought this to mind recently when I was reading an article about you know the recent Chinese stock market, a little flutter there. I don't think it's too traumatic yet. But they interviewed some woman in Beijing who was saying, well, she got this great stock tip from her hairdresser. And let me tell you from, you know, a lot of reading of history, if you're taking stock advice from your hairdresser, you're in the midst of a speculative bubble and you need to get the hell out. <laughs> and they just didn't do that. So those kind of things keep happening. Why? Because we're optimists. So the contemporary economy looks, U.S. kind of limited regulation, minimalist welfare state, weak union, strong managerial prerogative, and powerful antitrust legislation. It's all designed to let what Schumpeter called creative destruction flourish. But it wasn't always that way. The New Deal, which came in in, uh, in the 20s and 30s, that we had this increasing regulation, this increasing welfare state, largely as a reaction to the Great Depression. There were millions of people unemployed. You can't just let them starve. Uh, and there were some interesting things that didn't happen. You know, classical economic theory would have predicted that wages would have collapsed to the point where full employment began again. It's called a market clearing price for labor. Uh, if you talk to a serious economic analyst, you can come up with that figure for any place in the world, you know, that at X number of dollars, all the free labor should be taken up. So what should have happened during the Great Depression is that wages should have crashed, but they didn't. Turns out people just don't want, don't want to pay their fellow man, you know, a, you know, a mere pittance. Uh, it would have worked, though. I mean, it would have put more people back in the workplace, but government had to step in there. Although I don't defend FDR a lot, I think, you know, in some of those cases, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Project Agency, he was doing the right thing at the time. The other thing that was happening was that there was something new happening. Oh, corporations used to be run by their owners. You know, that, you know, if Carnegie ran Carnegie, Mellon ran Mellon Bank. And, and this, is, this is how capitalism developed globally. But in the 20th century, there was this increasing split between ownership and control. It's called the Burley Means Thesis, if you want to look it up. I think they wrote that in about 1957. Could be wrong, but I think that's correct. So what, what happens here is that, for example, I'm a, I'm a shareholder, shareholder in Harley-Davidson. I've got a few dozen shares. Nothing serious there. So... I own part of the firm. What kind of control do I have over it? Well, pretty much nothing. My only way of, of controlling Harley-Davidson is to attend the annual meeting, or in my case, being a, you know, it's a long flight to Milwaukee, uh, I tend to f file my proxy every year. I'll, I'll vote my shares. But basically, I'm voting for the board of directors who we have entrusted as shareholders to supervise management on our behalf. And there's a whole field of research about this on agency theory, but we're not going to go into that. So what happened is that separation of ownership and control led to this massive growth in management and managerial prerogatives. Uh, you might remember a certain Australian insurance firm that was known for having gold fittings in the loop. Well, you don't get that where, many, where, where people actually own the company that, you know, <laughs> that they're running. Very few people are toey enough you know, to invest corporate funds you know, in, in gold fittings. Uh, unless they own 100% of the firm or own none of it. And it turns out if you've got none of it, you may as well use the corporate money for your own. When uh, certain companies have their own air forces, which is an indulgence, uh, corporate jets, corporate, uh, we don't have any train jet as far as I know, corporate boats, helicopters, limousines, the whole nine yards of, of corporate access. So those traditional management systems of that era, you know, had increasing levels of bureaucratic control, regarded a, a, a very strong division of labor and a, and a very rigid separation between. So the New Deal with, with you know, FDR's baby was largely ineffective. You'll get a lot of argument about this. Uh, it's strange that... Uh, you know, nearly a hundred years later, we're still arguing about whether that whether or not it worked. I'm in the camp that says it probably didn't work. That what got us out of the Great Depression was World War II.
And what happened is the New Deal uh, effectively got took us into the war. Once the war began in Europe, uh, the U.S. Pr produced what's provided what's called Lend-Lease. Basically, we were the armorer for the world, or for the free world. Let's be very clear about that, although there are some companies that were selling to both sides, but we won't go into them either. That's a much longer story. But there's an enormous stimulus in the American industry. We were selling tanks, you know, GM, Ford made tanks. Uh, we, we, Douglas was making aircraft. You were shipping all these over, over to Europe you know, to, to, to fight the Nazis. And it wasn't until we actually got into the war that it started to cost us something. But that production created this massive boom in the American economy. It was all on the tab, by the way. You know, we, we, we took IOUs for all this stuff, and most of it got paid back, but some of it never did. I won't shame those countries today. But that post-war boom that occurred after World War II, we had all the soldiers coming home. The women had been in the workforce. My own mother worked in, a, in, a, in an ammunition plant, uh, which I find fascinating. She was... She operated, you know, of all things, a hydraulic press. You know, when I was a kid, I thought all she could press, you know, was my shirts. <laughs> Turns out she'd worked in heavy industry. Uh, Post-war boom was based on the standardization and stability of the managerial age. That we took these principles of Ford and made mass production, you know, the key to producing the, the, the great American middle class. Large firms became run by their tall ranks of salaried professional man general managers rather than by dominant entrepreneurs and owners. And in the 1950s, you know, this, the so-called man in the gray flannel suit, and with just a person that you plug into a position, they occupy the role, doesn't really matter whether the name is Ed or Fred, they're going to do the job for you. Managerial capitalism, as this is now being called, it was arguably less ruthless than what came before and after. Because it was a kinder, gentler kind of thing, the 50s were, you know, were in, the, in the U.S. were pretty relaxed. Eisenhower was always president. He was always on the golf course. Uh, the economy kept booming. We were, uh, folks came back from World War II and took the GI Bill, went to university, got highly educated, created the great American middle class, created this massive industrial boom. There is... A, whole suburbs created called Levitt Towns. So you'll have to look that one up yourself. And this growth was just unimpeded for decades, as it was in the rest of the world, which we'll get to. But it was routine, loyalty, and submission. That white-collar staff devoted their whole careers to one firm. I mean, most of you know that you're not going to spend your entire life working for one organization now. You're probably going to work for dozens. Trade unions at that time were a powerful political force. The, uh, the AFL-CIO and the Teamsters were very big at that time. Unionized, blue-collar workers had job security, considerable benefits. Hollywood movie studios churned out dozens of films, thousands of films, reaffirming the message of the U.S. way of life being uh, luxurious. Some believe that the industrial achievements of the managerial model were helping to spread advanced modernity all over the world. And there's some truth to that. I mean, if you were watching an American film of the 50s and 60s, you know, and you were in some other country, you go, wow, that's really impressive. I want to live like that. And you still see some of that happening. I mean, McDonald's is, strangely enough, a force for good in the world because people say, well, I want a piece of that. It's part of that soft power that people argue about all the time. Hollywood movies, McDonald's, Coca-Cola. I mean, the greatest uh, cross-marketing scheme in the world is Disney, McDonald's, and Coke. Uh, and everybody buys into it. Under the Bretton Woods system, which began in 1944, the U.S. dollar effectively became the world's res reserve currency re and remains so today. I mean, almost all international oil transactions are still recorded in U.S. dollars. The one reason is because you don't have to worry about hedging, and that's part of the problem. You know, when you have to worry about your currency and their currency, what's up, what's down, if you just do it all in U.S. dollars, it simplifies the process. But it, it, that kind of ended in the 70s. In common with most of the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, again, look it up, the USA was deeply challenged by the 1973 oil crisis. Oil prices tripled overnight. And what happened was, exactly as predicted by Friedrich von Hayek in his book, The Road to Serfdom, that this idea of Keynesian economics, that we can accept some inflation, 
to have full to have full employment meant reality when it came to inflation that this massive external shock of oil prices hit the, the, the global economy bang inflation shot up interest rates shot up employment went down and according to Keynesian economic theory it is impossible to have the so-called stagflation we had during that period of time that is high unemployment high inflation simultaneously that can't possibly occur in that model so how do we explain it? Well, we had Hayek who predicted that it couldn't handle that external shock. So what also happened is that at that point in time, the 70s and 80s saw renewed signs of strain in industrial relations. There were some fairly massive strikes. You might remember Ronald Reagan famously firing the air traffic controllers. Uh, and of course, Maggie Thatcher, you know, taking on Arthur Scargill and, and the coal miners union. So as a result of that, we moved from managerial capitalism to investor capitalism, where the shareholder reigns supreme largely. So the internal stakeholders, the managers of the company, lost power. The shareholders reasserted their rights as owners, is, is effectively what happened. So there was a concerted move of power away from managers back to investors. But again, as an investor, my, my power is still reasonably weak. The only way that I can really damn or that I can really show my displeasure of any of the firms that I invest in on an individual basis is to sell the shares. Yeah, I could be one of those pain in the ass, you know, shareholder activists, you know, you know attending the annual meeting and using the microphone, but they're not really paying attention to those folks. And frankly, nor should they. Because as a director of a corporation, you have one and only one fiduciary duty, and that's looking after the shareholders. So but the owners of capital nowadays, rather than being individuals like you and I, are, tend to be powerful institutional investors. I mean, your superannuation fund has a lot more power than you do in the marketplace. Um, I also own a share in, in, in uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway Holding Company. Uh, when Warren takes a position in a company, he takes a, a big chunk, which means he automatically is listened to. So those types of institutional shareholders wield real power nowadays, which is much different from you and I. Leverage buyouts became common in the 80s in particular, and for a number of reasons. One, because it's a lot more interesting you know, than sitting around managing a successful corporation. That you don't get your, your picture on the cover of the Wall Street Journal by running a successful corporation. You do it by pulling off the ultimate buyout, doing the art of the deal, as Donald Trump calls it. And again, this separation of ownership and control leads us to uh, an interesting conclusion. If you take as a correlation or as, as a, a correlate with CEO salary, the biggest single correlate is size of the, of the corporation. So it behooves the, the CEO of a company to, to increase the size of it to increase you know, their own salary. The other thing that happened was we had a lot more aggressive financial exercises, uh, leverage buyouts in particular using junk bonds. Uh, junk basically means, you know, you're talking interest rates 10, 15, 16 percent, kind of what Greece is going to wind up paying next week. Uh, and there were new financial instruments that were created. There was a Nobel Prize awarded a few years ago to the guys who pretty much invented uh, derivatives. And those derivatives do serve a real function in the marketplace, but you need to understand, you know, what that is. Largely, it's a hedging function. Uh, if I was a farmer, you know, and I, I've got a crop of, of winter wheat in, and I'm not, and I really don't, I mean, farmers are gamblers, aren't they? Bet their entire season, you know, on, on the weather. Well, I don't want to have my income looking like this all the time, so why don't I start hedging? So why don't I plant my wheat, and then I'm going to buy contracts? Derivatives, that's what they are, right? I'm going to go into the commodities market. I'm going to buy contracts to deliver wheat at, at X price. And I'm going to try to minimize my losses by doing that. It also, you know, cuts into my gains. But I don't have these wild fluctuations in my income anymore. So what happened was, after the 70s and 80s came about, after the Reagan Revolution, the U.S. emerged repositioned and much stronger at the forefront of a new high-tech frontier that technology now became the key. 
Politically, the state had retreated. I mean, that was the whole idea behind Reaganomics. The other thing that we, being that we were now globalized, I mean, you know, the, 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 the signal event of that entire period of time was, you know, the Berlin Wall falling in 1989. I mean, I still have a piece of the wall in, in, in my cupboard. Why? Because it was cool watching that on live TV. Have, having crossed, you know, through that gate myself, watching it be torn down by people with sledgehammers. I had tears in my eyes. But it meant pretty much the end of the argument. Capitalism had won. So, but because of that increase in globalization, we also needed to have better communication exercises. Uh, Larry Summers, who was Bill Clinton's second Treasury Secretary, and former president of Harvard, and, you know, and pretty bright economist generally, made a statement. Uh, he said it was no accident that the centrally planned economy and the centrally planned corporation both met their end in the same period of time. Because what happened is the external environment got too complex to have this huge hierarchy making decisions. And when we talk about Britain, now, I'll remind you that one of uh, Maggie Thatcher's advisors, Keith Joseph, in, 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 a, in, a, in a comment said that when they took over, when the Thatcherites took over Britain, the British cabinet was literally meeting to determine how much plumbers could charge for fixing a tap. And if you've got government involvement in the economy at that level, you've got a serious problem. And what happens is you, people at the top cannot make decisions at that level because they don't have access to all the information. That's what markets do. I mean, what a market effectively is, is a communication device. It takes everything we know about an, about an item and assigns it a, a, a value, a price. And we can look at it and go, oh, that's what it's worth. Pretty simple process. So what happened is we had this new performance culture. We had these flattening hierarchies. And that led to increasing unemployment for a while. And whole industries collapsed in that era. But again, that's uh, Schumpeter's idea of creative destruction. We also had new industries created. I was at university in, you know, in 1978 when the two Steves you know, quit their jobs and created Apple. The personal computer was invented when I was already studying you know, some computer science. And the world has changed a bit since then. I mean, for God's sakes, my watch has more power than the four computers that took Apollo 11 to the moon and back in 1969. That's just kind of scary. So... Industrial firms in general, though, were, were viewed at that point in time as value destroyers with some justification in that, you know, they were dinosaurs. They didn't keep up. I mean, investors in General Motors found out to their uh, chagrin that GM really didn't have any good ideas anymore. But the new age of investor capitalism meant an end to the stuffy and conservative image of corporate America. All of a sudden, that wasn't sexy anymore. Uh, to the investment community or the general public, we had we suddenly had CEOs, you know, who had high profiles. You know, they weren't just known to the corporate world; they were known, you know, to folks watching you know, the news at home at night. Everybody knew who Steve Jobs was. Everybody knew who Warren Buffett was. Everybody knew that Lee Iacocca had saved Chrysler not only once but twice. So what has happened is that although the overall structure of U.S. business has changed from one of stability and paternalism to one of ceaseless change. There still remains a lot of within-country diversity in models. So if you look at a, a firm at one part of the country, the Southwest and, and, and the South right now are much more dynamic. Uh, there's corporate flight from some of the traditional places that you'd think about it. Com companies are leaving California, New York, Illinois, and moving elsewhere for an, a more open and, and dynamic environment. And these new firms have much different structures. I mean, why is Microsoft located, you know, in, in Seattle? And you look at Dell in Austin, Texas. Well, there's a reason for that. I mean, they, they wanted to move away from the traditional areas because it was saltifying. So the problem of within-country differences in capitalism uh, is especially acute in the U.S. because it's a highly diverse area. The states do have a lot of authority. Uh, you need to understand that federalist relationship, uh, that the states do have a lot of independence. Most laws about commerce are state laws, except those where it's cross-border. Uh, 
So it's a complex plural system of government. There's 50 states, each with its own delegated powers. There's 50 different industrial relations environments. Well, and we've got the territory as well. Can't forget Puerto Rico, Guam, Saipan, the uh, St. Thomas, St. Croix, those kind of places. Your author argues, and I agree with him here, that it's difficult to get away from the idea that the U.S. system is built to champion individual rather than collective achievement. It clearly is. The founders, we know, who, who wrote the, the, the documents were students of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, not, you know, in a in the common sense, but they, you know, they, they'd read his books on, on the rights of man. If you look in the founding documents, among the, that are, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Individual kinds of ideals, and those are clearly embedded in the U.S. system. But it's one of the reasons that it, the U.S. businesses are so influential, because they're so dynamic. Uh, I heard someone describe the U.S. system once upon a time as it's the kind of place where the minute you get up on stage and say, this will never be done, somebody runs in the back door and says, guess what I've just done? And that's still largely true. So where is it going? We don't know right now. Uh, it'll find another strength. It'll emerge once again. I have no doubts about that because the system is designed to be just that way. Well, that's what all I have to say today. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.